It happened two days ago, on a night when dewdrops glistened in the moonlight in the field. She stood there for something, as if she didn't know what would happen to her. The settlement had been attacked by Quat. On the battlefield, the girl saw one of the riders and remembered everything she had heard earlier. His name is Nazar Quat. Nazar means blue eyes, and Quat is a wolf. When she met his sad blue eyes, somehow she realized everything, realized she couldn't get away from him anymore. She thought about running away. Maybe that day, if she hadn't listened to someone. No, if she hadn't met that man, then things might have been different. Her name is Rosetta Willard Fox, and today is the day she's free. She's finally free of everything that's been holding her back. Ever since she was a child, she's been told the same thing. That she was allowed to do nothing, that as a princess she must maintain her honor and dignity. A sacred land that no monsters could come near. The sacred kingdom of the fox, and the man ruling that kingdom, her father. Under the wing of such a father, the girl grew up without needing anything. But that is not what she truly desired. But like her older sister, that she had shown early promise in politics and magic and had become the crown princess. And like her brother, who had been promoted to commander of a knighthood at the age of 20 for his success in swordsmanship. Rosetta also wanted to achieve something on her own. However, her father had intentions of marrying her off to Mr. Eisel. After listening to her father, a thought suddenly occurred to her. If she was just like her brother and sister, maybe she would have another path other than marriage. When this journey was over, she would have to get married. She had never been able to do anything. All she has been given is just this trip. So she's going to try everything as much as she can so she won't have any regrets. Alan, the accompanying knight, runs up to the carriage on his horse, checking to see if the girl and her nanny are in trouble. Rosetta reports that the nanny is not feeling well and asks to look for some medicine. In the course of the conversation, the girl realizes that the nanny took the medicine before the trip, but did not follow the instructions, and from that she only got worse. Rosetta suggests that Nanny take a short break at one of the bodies of water nearby. The girl assures her that the woman is fine and asks why she burdened herself with the trip. She assumes that the Nanny wanted to make sure the girl didn't run away, but the girl assures her that she has already made arrangements with her father to marry her when she returns. The Nanny is pleased that the girl has changed her mind about getting married. Prince Isel Scallion, the next heir to the Archduchess of Helen, Kind in character and handsome in appearance, having finished listening to the nursemaid's praises and stories about Rosetta's future groom, the girl motioned for the woman to return to the carriage and continue their journey. They noticed a rider galloping hurriedly towards them. Noticing that the rider was a fearless girl, it caused Rosetta to marvel, but the girl on the horse was shouting at them to run in a language they did not understand. As soon as Alan heard the man, he realized what the language was but he didn't realize what was being said until the danger caught up with Rosetta and she was unable to dodge. The rider was able to fight back at the last moment against the monster, who surfaced out of the water, protecting Rosetta from danger. Rider tells her that this lake is crawling with monsters, which is why everyone avoids it. Rosetta is surprised, for she did not believe in their existence before. She had heard that monsters appeared and disappeared all over the continent but it never touched the sacred lands of the kingdom. She could only see them in books. Rosetta thanks the girl, asks about her well-being, and offers to help her with the sprained ankle she received as a consequence of defending the princess. After examining the horsewoman, Alan talks about what she has saved out of everyone and almost misses the point about Rosetta being a princess. Sometime before the journey, the girl asked him to keep it a secret. In gratitude, Rosetta's crew undertook to take the rider home and she offered them to stay with her for the night, since they were guests from far away. But the girl warns them that it might be a bit noisy at night, as she is having a wedding tonight. Rosetta is very surprised that the wedding is held at night, and the girl says that this is the custom in their tribe. The horsewoman decides to introduce herself. Her name is Rosie, her father, the chief of the Basque tribe. The Basque tribe. These places have long been the lands of the Adren, over time, they've been divided between several tribes. The Quat to the north, the Croy to the west, and the Basques to the east. The Basque tribe. The Basque tribe swore absolute loyalty to the kingdom. They were the strongest, 
Rosie tells me she's in the field because of today's wedding. It's an old tradition to have a wedding on the field. She says she was just going to get some air and everyone in the tribe is probably panicking right now. Rosetta worries that they're the reason the bride got hurt. And Rosie admits that she doesn't want to get married at all. Her future husband is 30 years older than her, so she hops on her horse and rides off. For the sake of increased strength, the tribe needed an alliance, and marriage was chosen to make it. Soon, the chief of the circle died, and the decision to marry Rosie was made very quickly and finally. And of course, her opinion had no weight in the matter. Rosie began to worry that she was talking too much, and asked the girl to tell about herself. To the nanny's surprise, Rosetta introduced herself by her real name, but told a story made up in advance. Arriving at Rosie's tribe, the inhabitants rushed to the girl with their worries and exclamations. The girl's father also met her, but seeing her wounded, he became even angrier. A hard slap knocked Rosie to the ground and left those who came with her in shock. The girl's father proceeded to yell at her for the look she had shown up in and about how she had embarrassed them with her escape. Unwilling to listen to the girl being told off so cruelly and in public any longer, Alan begins to stand up for the girl. But Rosetta interrupts him, drawing the chief's attention and taking the blame for the girl's absence for so long. Rosetta tells the tribal chief that they are travelers from the Fox Kingdom and tells him that his daughter saved them from a monster attack, resulting in an injury. The chief is not appeased and says that the girl is now unlikely to be able to travel on horseback after this. Alan quietly warns Rosetta that it seems that old traditions are still followed here. A woman is kidnapped and hidden. The so-called kidnapping ritual, it was later banned, but it's said that in some places it's still performed secretly. After negotiations with the bride's relatives, the groom puts her on a horse and drives her away. Rosetta offers to postpone the wedding because of the bride's injury, but the chief refuses and sends his daughter to a room and warns her that she will have to report to the tribe. Rosetta still offers to postpone the wedding, but Rosie says that they are already rushed. If they ask for a postponement, there could definitely be suspicion. The groom's side, that's the Craw tribe, they are constantly worried. If anything disrupts this wedding, then they will definitely refuse and unite with the Quat tribe. These lands have long been under the rule of the strongest kingdom on the continent. Therefore, the people who lived here also used the kingdom's language, Latin, in addition to the language of their own people. But recently, on the opposite side of the kingdom, another developing country has slowly begun to grow stronger. Compared to the northern peoples of Catan, who are known for their ferocity, they had a more brutal and soulless nature. That was why the kingdom had persuaded them to guard the borders of the state. Now the Quat tribe is gaining strength. They are uniting with other tribes to such an extent that it is beginning to be frightening, especially the army under the leadership of the young leader, which defeated even the ferocious Katanas, Nazar Quat. But everyone calls him the blue-eyed wolf. Nazar has cold eyes, and Quat means wolf. Rumor has it he's fiercer than the lake monster. In war, he was ruthless to others. It is said that he is cruel, as if he has no blood or tears. Therefore, the Rosy tribe unites with the Croy tribe through marriage. They have had thoughts of opposing him, but if the marriage fails, they will be isolated. Many tribes have already gone over to his side as it is. Rosetta gets the idea of using a doppelganger. It's so dark now. Under the veil, it would be hard to see who is behind it. Rosie supports the girl's idea. When the party starts, and the bride and groom make their way to the honeymoon room, then the bride can be switched. Rosetta starts to choose from the local girls, the one who can replace Rosie. But none of them is suitable, either by body or age or height. They need a young, slender, long-haired candidate. Rosetta catches Rosie's glance and does not understand what she is up to. The girl offers the princess to become her double. This leads the girl to shock. The nanny is against such a risky switch, but the girl convinces her of the safety of the plan and takes the woman's word that she will not tell the kingdom anything and will keep everything a secret. Rosie runs into the name tag and compliments Rosetta on her appearance. The girl thanks her once again for saving her. Rosie gives Rosetta a lantern made of starlight, for that is how brides are sought, and hands her a dagger so that she can defend herself in case of danger. But the princess does not know how to use cold weapons. The nanny is very worried about the girl 
and to the last, does not want to let her go. Suddenly a crowd of horsemen interrupts their dialogue, running into the tribe. The girl and Nanny heard shouting, and could not realize what it was until they heard shouts that it was Quat. The riders on horseback were bringing chaos, destruction, and death. In one of the riders, the girl recognizes Nazar Quat. The nanny tries to call Rosetta to run, but it is as if she is frozen in place. When Rosetta and the nanny realized that Nazar was running in their direction, they ran away. The girl didn't have time to escape before Quat grabbed her by the waist and ripped her off the ground. The nanny tried to do something to save her mistress, but all that was left of her on the cold ground was a lonely veil. The girl tried to persuade the rider to let her go, tried to explain that she was not the bride and he had confused her. But the guy only told her to sit quietly, lest she fall out and break her neck. Rosetta tried to tell the riders who rode up that she was not the bride and that she was her double and only wanted to help her. But they don't believe her because they used a double at the wedding on which the future of the tribe depends. The other horsemen begin to argue who will get the girl and what they will do in her to repay their tribe. For her father has done terrible things against them. But Nazar interrupts them and announces that the girl will be his wife. This shocks his men and they begin to exclaim that he is mad. But Quat interrupts them and asks how they can cross him. The Basques have the Fox Kingdom behind them and this will give them a fighting chance against them. The girl gets nervous and asks what kind of wedding they are talking about, for they didn't even ask her opinion, to which Nazar asked a counter question if the marriage she was about to enter into was by choice. But the girl could not answer his question. Rosetta was reminded of Asil's question on the day when her marriage was decided. He had asked her if she wanted to marry him. She didn't hate him. She had a hard time accepting that Isil would be her husband when he was like family to her. He convinced her that after the wedding, he wouldn't force her to do anything she didn't want to do and would wait until she was ready, no matter how long it took him. After stopping for the night, Nazar decided to see Rosetta off. But she said he could let her go. She wouldn't run away after all. She didn't know how to ride anyway. The boy was alarmed by this. He knew that living mixed with people from the kingdom you could lose your essence, but not that much. At Quat recalls hearing that Baskov's daughter is brown, while the girl has golden hair. The girl confirms this, and again tries to explain that she is not who she has been taken for, but she is interrupted by a shout from one of the riders informing Nazar that everything is ready. The boy grabbed her by the arm and started to drag her to the prepared mound, but she started to resist even though she realized that it would do no good. Having brought the girl into the namet and throwing her on the bed, Nazar began to take off his clothes, and the girl threateningly warned the guy not to approach her. The guy moves closer to the girl, and the girl threatens that she will scream, to which the guy tells her to scream and as loud as possible for everyone to hear. The girl is surprised by his request and interjects. Nazar says that he will let her go if she does what he says. The girl can't believe it's the guy Alan told her about. He is fiercer than any monster. You can't say he's cruel, but in the war, he was ruthless to the other tribes. As Quat turned away from the girl, she saw a chance to save herself and brought the dagger Rosie had given her over the guy. But Nazar proved to be faster and stronger. He intercepted the girl's hand with the dagger, dropping her to the cool bed. He didn't think the bride would prepare such a surprise on her wedding night. He took the dagger from the girl and offered to test its sharpness. The girl is overcome with fear and panic and asks the guy to let her go. But he only hurts his hand and only scares the girl. She does not understand his intentions and the reasons for his behavior. Alan arrives in the broken tribe and does not understand what happened. They had only agreed to play out the kidnapping. He immediately rushes to find Rosetta but finds only Nanny and Rosie at one and the Nemetes. The Nanny tells him about the kidnapping of the princess, and he is puzzled by what the groom's side is doing. But the woman goes on and tells him that Nazar Quat is behind it all. Alan asks Rosie to gather men to search for the lady, but they are interrupted by Rosie's father, the chief of the Basque tribe, and says there's nothing wrong with them capturing the fake, and sends his daughter off to prepare for the wedding. Rosie accuses her father of being heartless and says it's his fault, since he was the one who first stole a woman from their tribe for marriage, and they want to avenge them for the past. But Rosie's father is very angry at this accusation, 
and the girl feels her father's heavy hand on her again. The chief tries to explain to his daughter that he did it for the future of their tribe, but the girl claims that he was just greedy for power. Greedy enough to steal a woman from another tribe, killing her husband, and that everyone is aware that the scar on the chief's face was placed by the woman herself in an attempt to protect herself. The man takes another swing at the girl, but Alan intercepts his arm, not wanting to see Rosie treated this way any longer. He says that if the chieftain is not going to help them, then let him not stand in their way of saving the princess. Jumping on his horse, Alan reassures Nanny that he will find and rescue the missing princess. The chief of the Basque tribe winks in realization as the lad draws his sword from its sheath. Only one place uses these golden patterns, the sacred kingdom of the fox, a place where the descendants of the heavenly Elheim rule, a holy land under divine protection that monsters can't reach. These patterns stand for the kingdom of the fox. The kingdom has one prince and two princesses, and this missing girl is Rosetta Willard Fox. Alan confirms the man's hunch and thus reveals the girl's identity. People come to Rosie's father with bad news. The groom's side has refused to marry. Quat informs them that they have taken the bride and that if they want her back, they must come to them themselves. The man realizes he has no choice and orders them to gather forces and assist Alan in finding the royal princess. Alan is about to set off, but Rosie's father says that the Quat are obsessed with a thirst for revenge and they will definitely not let her go so easily, so all they have to do is destroy all the evidence. The young man is angry at his words, but he doesn't want to react and thinks how he can get out of there sooner and find the princess. The boy tries to make his way through the crowd, but is prevented from doing so, so he resorts to a mild threat. The chief, however, orders his men to stop him by any means necessary. Rosie's voice comes from behind. She orders Alan to lower his weapon, endangering Nanny's life. The woman yells for the young man to run and find the princess. Rosetta, sitting on the cool floor and with her back against the wall of the room, wonders aloud how it all came to this, to which Nazar, lying on the bed, replies that he just didn't like that boredom. When the time comes, he'll give it back to her father. She asks him not to lie. If he was going to give her back, he wouldn't have kidnapped her. To this, the guy tells her that even if she comes back, she won't be able to get married anymore. He'll bring her back when this marriage is completely broken. Rosetta doesn't understand why he promised to marry her then, and Nazar admits that this is his freedom. In the meantime, all she has to do is sit quietly and do nothing. The guy says that it will be cold at night and suggests that she go to bed, but the girl does not trust him and refuses. Assuring herself that everything will be fine, the princess curls up in a ball against the wall and falls asleep. Nazar takes her in his arms and carries her towards a normal bed. He gently covers her with a blanket, not daring to wake her. In the backyard of the castle was a small garden for Rosetta. Her parents and older brother and sister were very busy. Therefore, the princess spent time in this garden all the time. The girl had an imaginary friend named Masha. At least her mother thought that the imaginary one until she herself saw a bird covered with golden feathers. As if in a dream, when she opened her eyes, everything disappeared like a mirage. Rosetta woke up and jerked up sharply on the bed. She had definitely fallen asleep on the floor, but somehow ended up in the bed. Nazar met her with a cooked meal, saying that the girl had slept like a murderer, and it was lucky he didn't have to wake the girl himself. Nazar was met outside by his subordinate, who had brought some women's clothes from the village to wear. The guy dropped off the dress to Rosetta, his concern worries her, but he leaves her and tells her to change clothes, and afterwards, they will continue their journey. The girl realizes that at this rate, Alan will not catch up with them, and she should pull the maximum time to delay them. She stops Nazar halfway to the exit and asks him to help her braid her hair so it doesn't get tangled. Nazar calmly beckons the girl over to him and asks her to turn her back to him. His hands, to Rosetta's surprise, are not as rough as they should be for a man who holds only a sword. He weaves her a ribbon that he used himself, but asks her to return it, for it is his mother's ribbon. This information greatly surprises the princess, and the young man leaves the Nemeta, leaving the girl alone. After the girl has changed her clothes, a couple of men burst into her room on Nazar's orders to take the evidence of their first wedding night. 
That's why he injured himself during the night. Rosetta doesn't understand why Nazar is sticking up for her so much. Meanwhile, he helps her climb onto his horse and continue their ride. Alan and Nanny are imprisoned in the dungeon, and the woman regrets that the boy did not escape in time. But Alan realizes that he wouldn't have made it anyway without the tribe's help. They never thought Rosie would do this to them. Suddenly, Rosie approaches their cells, and the guy is angry at the girl. But she says her father doesn't know she's here. She offers them some good food. She tells them that the prisoners are being watched closely right now, so it's hard to get them out of here now. But she promises that she will get them out as soon as she gets a chance. But the girl says she'll let them out on the condition that they don't tell about the kidnapping of the princess. This angers Alan and he moves on to threatening Rosie, but she suggests that they think about it. Alan ponders that they need the help of someone with a high position in the army who can rescue the princess secretly from the kingdom. Someone who will take care of Rosetta and who is able to lead the army. The name of the right man immediately comes to Alan's mind, Duke Isil Scallion. Alan suggests contacting the Duke to gain his support. He writes him a letter and tells him that the man will be here in three days. After giving the letter, Alan asks Rosie about the conflict between the Basque tribe and the Quat tribe. There is nothing to hide. The guy has heard everything, so Rosie agrees to tell the story. Rosetta's back is already breaking from this endless gallop. She's so tired, her body's all wobbly. He won't even notice if she leans back a little. Nazar stops them all and suggests they take a break at one of the edges of the forest. The girl is bothered by the way everyone is looking at her and realizes that she won't be able to escape at this rate. The boy says it's worth it to hit the road again. As Rosetta approaches the horse, notices that a bedding has been made for her. She freezes, and when he asks the reason, she says it is too high for her. The guy takes the girl in his arms without a word, puts her in the saddle, and they continue on their way. During the ride, the girl apologizes for asking her to braid. She didn't realize that the ribbon Nazar braided her hair with belonged to his mother, to which the guy calms her down and tells her that he doesn't treasure the thing as much as she thinks he does. They set up camp on one of the edges surrounded by forest. The girl is hungry. Some young man offers Nazar to catch a rabbit for Regina, which surprises the girl, and she is told that she has previously eaten rabbit, and Rosetta is horrified. She asks the young boy why she is called Regina and who it is in general. He tells her that this is the name given to the wife of the tribe's chief, to match his name, Rega. The girl asks who Nazar Quad is then, she is told that it is the name by which outsiders call him. The young man is surprised that she did not know that the chief is called Riga. The young man then reproduces his surprise at Riga, that Regina does not even know the groom's name. The young man suggests that it was hard for her to ride all day on horseback. The girl confirms that she is tired, and the young man exclaims that she is naturally tired, even after last night, and should be better taken care of. Rosetta feels ashamed even though nothing happened last night. Riga approaches them and stops the young man's exclamations. He tries to convince the chief that the girl needs care. Riga interrupts him and sends him to get wood in the forest. Rosetta remains alone with Riga by the fire, and the boy becomes curious about the fact that the girl asked him about his name. She has to know anyway, so he's going to tell her. His name is Rashid. Rosetta realizes she knows that name. A few years ago, there was a small reception attended by everyone close to the royal family. The reception was just beginning. A wandering poet appeared, originally from the Ardennes. Everyone looked at him curiously, wondering who he had been called to sing for. People whispered that it would be a song praising the wisdom of the first princess or the courage of the prince. But the poet himself declared that he would sing for Princess Rosetta. The song was called The Light of Rashida. When he finished speaking, all eyes turned to the princess for a second. Every time his fingers touched the strings of the harp, music flowed through the hall, followed by high-syllable verses. They sang of Princess Rosetta's nobility. The angelic song charmed everyone and made the princess the center of attention. The king, impressed by the song, asked why the song was called Rashid's Light. The poet explained that if the name of the protagonist was translated in the manner of the Arden language, one would get Rashid. Rashid. The man who kidnapped her had the same name as her. The guy himself had clarified with her that her name was Rosie, 
and the girl had confirmed it. He promised that his subordinates would not behave like yesterday again. Whoever she is, they must accept her as his wife. Out of the forest runs the young man that was talking to the girl earlier, Sika. He cries out as he walks that trouble has come. The monsters are here. Riga leaves Rosetta by the fire, because the monsters will not come near him. But the girl thinks about the fact that this is her chance for escape. Riga and her men fight the monsters in the thick of the forest. One of them sneaks up behind the chief's back, indicating that the creatures have gotten stronger and smarter. A few run away, but they decide not to chase them. Rosetta runs through the trees trying to escape and asks for help from forces unknown to her. This triggers a wave of memories of playing hide and seek with the servants as a little girl. Then she went into a forbidden room and saw something. Hearing a noise behind her, the girl was startled. Out of the bushes in her direction came a guy from Riggi's squad who was not at all pleased with her last night. He began to suspect Regina of running away. Rosetta started to justify that the camp was attacked by monsters, and while she was running away, she got lost. But the guy did not believe her, because the camp is completely in the opposite direction. The girl reminds him that she is the wife of the chief, and he has no right to touch her. Only Riga can deal with her. This infuriates the guy, and he declares that he never recognized Rashid as Riga. He had no right to be one in the first place. The guy asks if she knows what his blue eye color means. He continues and says that it is proof that he is illegitimate. The girl tries to free herself from him, but the guy bestows her with a slap and orders her to listen further. In the past, the chief of the Basque tribe kidnapped Regina, after which the woman returned alone and gave birth to a baby with blue eyes. In the past, the chief was disgraced when he tried to possess a woman and was never able to cope from that disgrace and threw that woman to the slaves. Rashid's father was one of those slaves. And then, Rega, being the chief, dropped everything and rushed there alone. Regina was freed, but there he died there like a dog. In the morning, their tribe, which had lost its chief, was mercilessly defeated by the Basques. They were on the verge of extinction, and he, the one who wasn't even supposed to be born, became Riga, and his mother died naming him Rashid to make him Riga, and he quietly bears that name, the name of the only son and descendant of Ark, the god of light. The guy started to shorten the distance between them, and the girl started to ask for help. Suddenly, he flew away from the girl, and an enraged Rashid towered over her. Riga and Sika were quickly heading towards the camp, and the latter said he was glad that Rashid was willing to take care of his wife. Memories of his time in the Quat tribe overtook the young man. The great battle between the Catan tribe and the Quat tribe five years ago. The sole survivor of the Quat tribe, one of the chief's blood relatives, has been brought to Riga, offering to deal with him. He had lost everything at such a young age. But Riga liked the glint in his eyes, which showed a fighting attitude. So the chieftain decided to take him away for a while. From that day on, Sika became part of the Quat tribe and tried his best. At first, of course, he tried to gain everyone's trust, and he showed great ability in the military. After that massacre with the Catan tribe, Sika gave light. However, before Sika was universally recognized, he suffered enough. Sika tells Riga that Regina is like a doll made of sugar and gold, and this is the first time he's ever seen a girl so beautiful. She's like a princess. Riga thinks about it, a doll, doesn't ride a horse, no appetite, she wants to go home. Seems she is only playing the role of the chief's daughter. Sika exclaims that Riga fell in love with her immediately, that there is something about her that made him take her as his wife. Riga recalls laying the sleeping girl on the bed on their very first night together. Gently, trying not to wake her up, Riga asks Siku where Krell is. The young man says he doesn't like him and is probably somewhere now, loitering. He says that Krell was always complaining about Rashid, as if Riga's place should belong to him and not Rashid. Rigi says that the latter would have become the tribe's chief if Rashid hadn't been there. One of their troop runs up to them and reports that Regina is missing. Rega runs to the girl's aid and begins to interrogate Krell while Sika comforts and cares for the girl. Krella says that he discovered that she was trying to escape and only tried to stop her. Riga talks about hurting his wife, Regina, and that he will pay for it. 
Krella objects, saying that Rashid's blue eyes tell that he is illegitimate and that you can't fool the blood. Krell pulls out his sword, and the girl doesn't understand what that means. Sika explains that if Krell is to be punished, it must be now. If not, Riga will be accused of cowardice and his position in the tribe will be jeopardized. Riga and Krell cross their blades and engage in a duel. A flashback comes over Rosetta. The boy asks the girl which of the knights she will give the flowers to this time, him or Isolt. The girl says that last time Isel got the flowers, so now it's Armand's turn. The boys start to argue about who Rosetta likes more, and they decide to ask the girl personally, which puts her in a stupor. She is saved by Rosetta's older sister, besieging the boys and reminding them of the evening formal reception. Everyone disperses to prepare for the event, but Isel asks Rosetta to stay because he has a conversation for her. The boy asks Rosetta when she grows up to support only him. Sika notices that Riga's movements on the battlefield have changed. It's definitely the monster's poison. He hurt himself while fighting them, and it looks like the poison got into the wound. Rosetta is worried, but Sika reassures her and tells her that you don't die from poison, but Krell will stall until Riga is weakened enough. Krell wounds Riga and Rosetta, worries about how long they will fight. Sika says that the winner of the fight decides, and he will pass judgment on the loser, whether he lives or dies. Riga's arm was paralyzed, and Krella took advantage of that and swung his weapon at him, but Rashid was quicker and clipped Krell's ankle. The latter shouts out that this is mean, but Riga lays siege to him, for it is not for him to complain of meanness. The stricken Krella begs for mercy. Riga says he will give him a chance if he admits his mistake. Moreover, he will be punished for his transgression when they return to the camp. Krell thanks the chief for his leniency and promises not to confront him again. But Rashid stops him and tells him that it is not him he should apologize to, alluding to his wife. Wounded, Krell crawls to Regina's feet and apologizes to her, saying that he has misbehaved towards her. Back at the camp, Riga finds Regina in one of the hammocks and says that he asked her to stay here. His hand rises above her, and the girl prepares to take the blow but the guy's hand comes down calmly next to her arm, and he says he wasn't even thinking of hitting her. Tears come to the girl's eyes. Rashid asks why she is crying. Rosetta can't hold back any longer and goes to scream pushing away Riga. The girl says it's all because he kidnapped her. But the guy says he will bring her back, but she doesn't believe him. He tries to calm her down and pulls her closer to him, preventing her from hitting him further. At that moment, Sika walks in with medicine and bandages for Rigi and interrupts them. After hesitating, the young man quickly leaves them. Rashid tries to explain himself to Rosetta. He took her as his wife to prevent the alliance of the Basque tribe with the Kwa tribe. When the wedding broke down, he thought he would get her back. The girl says he could have just pressured the chief if that was his goal. But then people from the kingdom would have intervened. The girl is surprised and the guy tells her that the kingdom puts the Basques on the front lines while taking advantage of the fact that they themselves remain behind them. About 20 years ago, the Fox Kingdom made a pact. The Basques had already had something like this, and then the Quat made a request to the kingdom, and the king refused to interfere in matters of marriage. He said it was a wild custom, but when problems arose, the kingdom laughed that it would respect another's culture. If this happened about 20 years ago, it was when Rosetta's grandfather was still on the royal throne. She didn't remember much about him, only that he was intimidating and stern. In reality, that was just an excuse, as the kingdom did different things using the Basques. The guy does not want to continue and delve into the topic, especially since it does not concern the girl. But Rosetta casually blurts out that it does. But she guffaws that it's because she's in a similar situation. Guy says that's why he took her as his wife, to keep her safe from what happened recently with Krell. Riga says that the chief of the Krua tribe will demand a wedding to another in a month, and when the wedding happens, he will return her to her father. The girl ponders that if she returns to the kingdom in a month, she should live as if nothing happened as before. Rashid starts unbuttoning his shirt, which scares the girl. But later, she realizes that he only wants to treat her wounds, and a feeling of shame comes over her. She stops him when Rashid starts dressing himself, and tells him that if he doesn't disinfect the wound properly, it might fester, and offers to help. This is her thanks for saving him. 
But Rashid says she didn't quite understand, and he was only dealing with the fact that Krella was trying to humiliate him. She understands, but still wants to help him. Rosetta didn't realize she could use a checkup at the doctor's office as a child. Alan also taught her a little bit, so she should be able The girl asks about what will happen to her after she returns home. Riga is starting to get annoyed by this question, and her reasoning about being the girl who was seduced and dumped after one day. She ponders the fact that if the truth of what happened comes out after her return, the entire royal family and aristocracy will be whispering behind her back, calling her a poor and unfortunate princess. Riga says that when she returns to the Basque tribe, he will say that they had no intimate relations. The girl asks if they will believe him, but he says they will believe him, because the attacker is believed more than the victim. This surprises the princess. Rashid says that his mother once insisted that she was pregnant with him before the kidnapping, but she was not listened to, because people believed the chief of the Basque tribe more. Allegedly, the mother had gotten pregnant by one of the slaves and lied to make the illegitimate Riga. Rosetta remembers what Krell told her, that his mother named him Rashid to make him Riga. The boy says that his mother died proving that he inherited the blood of the Quats, proved it with her death. People believe what they're told before they die. Maybe it was more important for his mother to be recognized as a chief's wife than to be there for him. It's funny because his father did all this to save the woman he loved. As a result, it didn't work out to protect anyone. There was not much negativity in the girl's life, however. The desire for revenge against the Basques is getting bigger and bigger. Rosetta asks why he does not take revenge on her, to which she gets the answer that she is not guilty of anything. He says that this vengeance he will exact as he sees fit, and on the one who should take it. Her father's throat will surely be in his hands. As she finishes treating the wound, the girl involuntarily begins to reason that his father cares about everything he has accomplished. As she speaks, she is mesmerized by Rishda's eyes, which remind her of gems. But she doesn't notice how she talks about the beauty of his eyes out loud, and embarrassment comes over her in a strong wave and she tries to hide herself by going to bed. After a while, Riga walks over to the sleeping Regina and thinks about all the stupid things he said, and she should have examined herself first. Nightmares from the past haunt him in his sleep, an illegitimate child and a chieftain. He should not be recognized. Purebloods can't be chiefs. You're saying Regina lied. He had to survive, to pay for the sins of a father who abandoned his tribe to save a woman. If it hadn't been for that stupid choice, maybe there would have been a way to stop these useless sacrifices. The boy snuggled down on the bed next to the girl. The warmth made him think of the past, the time he and his grandfather had found the wolf, and Rashid hadn't wanted to let it out of his arms. But his grandfather had told him that if they didn't let him go, he wouldn't be able to return to his pack for the rest of his life. Rosetta woke up and noticed that everything was ready for her. She wondered if Rashid was even asleep, Immediately, he brought her a piece of fresh bread and sat down next to her, watching her. The girl asks why the guy is looking at her so intently. He tells her that he remembered an animal he had raised before, a wolf. She quenches that the guy is comparing her to a wolf. Rosetta recalls that Riga said he would cooperate until Chief Croa had a new wife. He says you can only say that about people who have an equal relationship. She understood his plan and is willing to keep quiet because of it. In fact, things seem to be working out very well. A man like her grandfather is going to marry a girl, beautiful, young, charming. She is interrupted by the man's laughter, and he asks if she is talking about herself like that. But the girl says no, she is not talking about herself. Abruptly approaching the girl, Riga asks if she has hurt herself somewhere after yesterday's incident. She is taken aback and replies that apart from a slight tingling sensation, it doesn't hurt anywhere else. Rashid holds out a jar to Rosetta. While he went to the village to get food, he met an old witch doctor. She said it would do for wounds, so she should use it for where it hurts. Riga is called from the street and he leaves the girl. Says that if she's done with her food, let her go out, but she can take her time. Outside, Sika strikes up a conversation with one of Riga's charges. He believes that Regina was trying to escape and Krella was really trying to prevent her escape. But Sika disagrees, for they have just heard laughter from the Namet. And that really surprised them, since Rega never laughed. 
The other guy says that he doesn't think he would leave that cunt around him. Siku is annoyed at the way the guy talks about Regina, but the guy says that she's the daughter of the Basque chief and should be grateful to be accepted. This makes Sika very angry, and he warns him that he won't tolerate him swearing about Regina again. The other guy says that Sika wasn't expected to be any different since he's from a different tribe. He doesn't know the shame they've suffered. Sika pulls his sword out of its sheath and the guy starts to calm him down, and he puts the weapon away and leaves. Sika will not forgive anyone who goes against Riga. Sika checked on Rosetta at her name tag. The young man asked to be called on a first name basis. She is Riga's wife after all. The girl associates him with a cute dog. Regina is afraid that she has allowed herself too much, but Sika says that she can think of him as a little brother. Something crashes against Rosetta's hand and she is startled, but Sika calms her down and introduces her to Akal. Akal turns out to be the horse that has been carrying her these three days. He plays with her. Sika says it's rare, which means he likes her. Sika suggests that Regina meet him and pet him. Rosetta is afraid, but thinks she should meet the horse that made her travel this far. Riga approaches them, and Sika brags about introducing Regina to Akal. Riga says that they should go, and the girl says that she will go with Sika, as Rashid is injured, and she is afraid of hurting his wounds. This surprises them a lot. Sika tries to explain that offering a person of the opposite sex to ride with her on the same horse is literal after all. Sika doesn't have time to finish her sentence before Riga grabs the girl by the waist and lifting her easily, places her on his horse. A cool breeze and warm sunshine. The smell of flowers enveloping from head to toe. Rosetta is visited by the thought that Rosie feels it too when she rides her horse. Rosetta asks Riga about what Sika said about the horses. The boy explains that it is not their custom to get on the same horse with someone with whom you are not in a loving relationship. But the girl says that Sika isn't even a man yet, after all, but a young guy. Riga asks if the girl knows what Sika's nickname means, Trakakanin. It translates to crazy dog. Regina wonders how they can talk about this young man like that. Rashid says he only looks small and cute, but during a fight he can fight for five men. Regina says, stroking a call, that this is the first time she has seen such a beautiful horse. Rig is interested in this and asks what is beautiful to her. She says that since childhood she has called all rather unusual and atypical things beautiful, such as different insects, plants, and the like. Rashid shares her point of view. Riga says that they don't have long to go, and the girl regrets that she won't be able to go horseback riding again. He offers to teach her how to ride if she wants. This makes her very happy, for she thought she wasn't allowed to do anything, but Rashid changes her mind. She is allowed everything except running away. The Archduchess of Hazen. Duke Isil receives a letter from the chief of the Basque name. A man enters the room and asks who the envelope came from. In the envelope, the butler discovers Princess Rosetta's bracelet. The man is furious and sends the butler to invite the person who left the letter into his office. A man in a cloak enters the study with permission. It is a messenger from the Basque tribe. He says he was sent here by the daughter of the Basque chief, Mrs. Rosie, and a knight named Alan. The man promises not to tell the Fox Kingdom about this, but asks them to tell him everything that really happened. The man says that the princess is an important person to him, and his son left the castle not too long ago so he won't be able to help him right now. The messenger says that he himself knows nothing for sure. The only thing he knows is that unlike Mrs. Rosie, the Basque chief is against the release of the princess. In truth, the messenger continued, the chief was unaware of the princess's true status and allowed himself to be rude. The man says they will discuss the details further, but for now he asks him to wait outside. A woman approaches the man and confesses that she overheard the conversation inadvertently. She asks to read this letter. The man thinks about what to do next. The woman says that maybe this is the chance. He was so saddened by Assault's engagement. In the Fox Kingdom, the eldest child inherits the throne, regardless of gender. Besides, you can become anything here if you have the right talent and perseverance. For example, that's how Armand got the title of Commander of the First Order of Knights. And Princess Rosetta has been constantly sick since she was a child. 
There's nothing special about her except her pretty face and learned affability. They sent Isil to them because they hoped that the eldest princess would fall in love with him. If that happened, then the next ruler, with special abilities unique to heirs, would be Isil's child. As you want to make fate laugh, tell her your plans. Isil chose Rosetta over the eldest princess Tanith. Isil's father doesn't realize what a chance this is. The woman, Isil's mother says that the princess's disappearance is only to their advantage. The Archduchy of Hazen was founded by the kingdom, but their bond has weakened greatly over the last hundred years. They sent their only heir there to protect their borders and regain their former favor. She regrets that decision and, the man suggests, she probably does too. The man says that if Isel had given his heart to Tanith, who knows if she would have reciprocated his feelings. The woman surprises him by saying that she does, in fact, love him. The Kingdom of Lisa a few years ago. Isel's mother was at a tea party with the queen. The queen says that, unlike the other children, Rosetta grew up with no education other than a basic education. She is now at the age where it is time to get married. Her majesty is worried and fears that this will affect the attitudes of those around her. She wanted Rosetta to be able to live an ordinary life. As a simple woman, loved by her husband, and as a mother who loves her children. Even then, the woman understood everything. Princess Tanith's almost elusive gaze, in which a storm of emotions could flash in a second. And who it stopped at? Isil's mother finishes her story, and the man asks why she didn't tell him before. She says that if Rosetta remains missing like this, it will change everything. She offers to do nothing, thus covering up the princess's disappearance. Riga wakes the girl and tells her that they have arrived in Adirna, the capital. Sika raises the blue flag and proclaims the return of the chieftain. They ride through the city, and Rosetta looks at the area around them. These people look so free and peaceful. It is all different from what she has read before about the Ardennes. She thinks back to the events of three years ago in the capital city of Terra. Rosetta was riding with her mother in a carriage and contemplating the city. She asks her mother why there are so many poor people here when Terra has always been considered the richest city in the world. But the queen says the princess should not ask such things. Rosetta comes back to reality and realizes that Riga has covered her with his cloak so as not to attract unnecessary attention. They arrive at the castle of Adirna. Riga helps the girl off the horse, and when they ask him who it is, he says only that it is his wife. But he continues and says that she used to be the daughter of the chief of the Basque tribe. Now this woman is his consort, and their Regina. He asks the servant to show Regina to her room, for she must be very tired from three days' travel. Reggie himself has unfinished business, so he cannot join them. As the servant Thelma leads Regina to her chambers, the girl looks around with interest, and the woman thinks about the fact that she doesn't look like she was brought here by force. Or she's very good at faking it. Thelma asks if Regina has any questions, and she wonders about the patterns of the walls and ceilings. She thinks it must be some kind of special paint. Not really. The servant tells her that it's all about the sap of special trees that only grow in these parts. A lot of people want to get their hands on this paint. The Fox Kingdom, for example, demands it as tribute. But Mr. Rashid is well aware of the value of this paint and does not share it with anyone. He has an excellent grasp of financial matters. It is to his credit that their tribe, once on the brink of destruction, has achieved such prosperity. They continued on their way, and Thelma began to wonder more intensely if everything was consensual or if he had taken her by force, whether she should be escorted to his room or to a separate room. This was something that Riga did not specify. Thelma asks Regina what she thinks of Riga. She says he is a kind and considerate man. Thelma's gaze falls on the ribbon in the girl's hair and she begins to justify that Rashid gave it to her when she had nothing to fix her hair with. The maid asks if she knows what the item is. Regina reveals that Riga said it belonged to his late mother. The woman is shocked. He's never given anyone anything for nothing in his entire life. And here's a personal item. And not just anyone, but the daughter of the chief of the Basque tribe. Thelma says it's not really an ordinary ribbon. It was tied around the bouquet of flowers that the last Riga gave to his Regina when he proposed. Rosetta says she didn't know that. The servant continues, and says that Adirna is famous for its colors. 
and it is very difficult to create that shade of purple. One little bit too much color and everything is ruined. Mr. Rashid is doing everything in his power to preserve this jewel. After taking the girl to Rigi's chambers, Thelma advises the girl to rest while the woman herself takes care of dinner. The girl asks if she can take a bath first. Thelma comes out of Rigi's chambers and orders that Regina have the water heated. But the second servant girl, Benny, can't wait to find out what Regina is like. Everyone's so curious about her, she's so sudden. Thelma says she's only had a few words with her herself, so she doesn't know it takes time. Benny says Regina doesn't speak Ardennes at all. Thelma didn't know and was surprised. Benny says she learned it from Sika, and Benny says she speaks Latin, though she doesn't really know it that well. But Thelma picks up on her hint and promises to stick it to Regina. A room with no paintings or decorations, time-worn, first-class furniture, rugs. The atmosphere in this room is as stunning as its owner, and from the windows one could see the center of the city well. The servants brought the girl a bathtub, and she was surprised because she thought they had at least a separate bathroom. Regina is introduced to Regina by a servant and introduces herself as Benny. From this day forward, she will be her personal maid. Benny volunteers to help Regina. Later, she marvels at the beauty of her hair and the soft, delicate skin. Thoughts fill Rosetta's head. Benny is so kind. Maybe the younger generation isn't so negative towards the Basque tribe. This is the first time she's been treated so well, unless you count Sika. Thanks to that, the anxiety goes away. Beanie is surprised to find a scar on the girl's back, but Regina reassures her and tells her that she hurt herself as a child. The maid calms down, or else arrows leave pretty painful wounds. But the nanny tells Rosetta that it happened when she was playing in the garden. But the maid says this scar is definitely from an arrow. Benny shares that she was very surprised when she saw her. It was unexpected that Riga brought a woman. Some say she is just a guest, but she thinks the girl is Regina. Rosetta asks where Riga went, and Benny says he went to see Elder Kalanta. This is Riga's maternal grandfather. Rosetta assumes that this man is very important to Rashid if he went to him right away. Benny says that if it weren't for his grandfather, Rigi wouldn't exist at all. Regina wonders about the flowers that are scattered in the water. It's lavender. It is used for its pleasant odor or as medicine. After the bath, the girl is brushed, and her eyes dart to the chair where she left her things that were taken away. Rosetta jumps up, asking where her hairband is. Benny says her things were taken to the furnace, and panic comes over the girl. She asks where her clothes have been taken, and asks to be taken away now. That ribbon, the only thing Rashid has left from his late mother. Regina runs over to the stove where her clothes are already burning. She sees no other options, and pulls her hand into the flames. Rega meets the elder Kalante. Rashid declares that there will be no more cause for concern. The elder offers to come inside. Kalante Castle. Krell returned yesterday with a wounded leg. Riga wonders how Elder Persis reacted to this. Rashid's grandfather says that he was, of course, extremely outraged, since such a thing had happened to his only heir. But since Krell was the first to report the duel, there was nothing he could do. The Elder tells him that he is deliberately averting his gaze from what could turn into a bigger problem. Elder Percy's lands are very close to the territories that belonged to the Basque tribe. Therefore, if he holds a grudge against Riga for disgracing the heir, it could turn into trouble. Riga catches the gist of what the Elder wants to convey to him and finishes the thought instead. It is better to get rid of Krell, and as quickly as possible. If he died during the duel, Perse would have to accept his death. But in the current situation, it was highly likely that the Elder would decide to take revenge. He has always protected his offspring, but now that he's crippled, especially. Riga talks about how he was going to kill Krell, but he changed his mind. It seemed to him that it would hurt more to limp for the rest of his life. But Krell did cross the line. He insulted him and his wife. The elder is surprised and asks what he means. How did the man who was in such a hurry to prevent the union of Basque and Croix find time to marry himself? The elder guesses that the bride is the daughter of the chief of the Basque tribe. Riga reassures his grandfather and says that of course when the time comes, he will bring her back to the family. He can't make the daughter of his enemies his wife. The elder says that he has looked into what Riga asked him to do. They say this place is hard to get into, even the Fox Kingdom. 
He wonders why Rashid, all of a sudden, is interested in the affairs of the temple and the kingdom. The last time Riga came to Terra, he heard something curious. He was led to a man who told him that he had once worked in the castle guards of the Fox Kingdom. He got drunk and started talking about some very strange things going on there. He had seen some things there. Ten years ago, there was a hunt in the castle. Right in the castle, not around it. A bird. It's not certain, but as he said, the bird was shot first, then the man. Riga hadn't paid much attention to those words at the time, thinking the man was too drunk, except that he remembered that the fox king had died ten years ago. And that brought him back to the man's story. According to tradition, when a king passes away, his body is shown to the people before being buried. Last time that tradition was partially disregarded. They said the cause of death was a fall from a horse. But if the king was the victim of an accident, there is no reason to hide his body. The elder recalls another rumor that he died at the hands of a monster. But Riga says that's a rather strange assumption. Monsters can't get into the fox kingdom. The elder says he thought of Ataraxia. She's usually called Maestra. But in Ardenese, she's Atacaxia. The last references to her can only be traced back to records that are more than a few hundred years old, so it's not even known if this bird is real. Ataraxia is a symbol of the influence of the Fox Kingdom. Even though it hasn't been shown for a long time, their power and authority is still immense. The Elder asks why this is all so interesting to Riga. He says that he wants to know if the Fox Kingdom had anything to do with what happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago, during the war that Elder Kalante waged, he saw a golden light. After the past Riga had died, the Basque tribe had forced the Quat tribe out of their lands. The one who was to be the next chief looked strangely lost. He didn't seem like his usual self. During the battle, he noticed the golden sword of his opponent. A golden sword is proof that a person belongs to the royal family or holds an important position in the state. The elder concludes that then it cannot be ruled out that the Fox Kingdom could be behind this. But Riga doesn't understand why they would want to do this. Some time ago, the Eastern tribes united and founded the state of Toulouse. Fearing the resulting threat, the Fox Kingdom has decided to wreak havoc on the lands, inciting the Basque tribe to do so. Riga says they must get to the bottom of this. Rashid was about to leave, but the elder asked him if a banquet was planned. Riga doesn't get the gist of the question at first. The man said that they should celebrate their wedding. It would be strange of them not to have some kind of celebration, even if the wife is temporary. Rashid drives up to Adirna Castle and is visited by thoughts of what she is doing now. She's very tired, so she's probably asleep by now. So soundly that she wouldn't even notice if someone came in, like last time. He stops himself, not realizing why he's been thinking about this girl more often. Riga goes into the stables and wakes up the drunken stable boy, Mark. He says that Rashid has traveled a long way and should rest, and that Mark will take care of the horse. Riga doubts that Akal will listen to the drunkard, but the stableman says that he is still the only one besides Riga who is allowed to touch him. Rashid says that another such person has appeared, and Akal likes him so much, no comparison to Mark. The stableman is surprised and says that this horse is never given to anyone. Riga changes the subject and asks to find a mare that is small and quiet for a temperament. The stableman asks why the chief would want one. He replies that someone wants to learn to ride. When asked who it is, Riga replies that it is his wife. Their conversation is interrupted by a servant with breaking news. She informs them that Regina is badly hurt. Riga runs over to the girl surrounded by servants. Her hands are dipped in a bucket of water and her clothes are dirty. He thinks someone has wronged her for being from the Basque tribe. He took her hands out of the water and asked what had happened to her but the girl only remained silent. Then he decided to ask the others who did this to his wife. At Riggy's feet, Benny throws herself at his feet. She says it's her fault. She didn't know that this thing meant so much. If she had known, she would never have let it be thrown into the fire. Rosetta stands up in front of the servants and says it's not Benny's fault. It's because she put her hair ribbon in the wrong place. Regina says she tried to find it, and when she got here, it was almost burned she holds out what she could salvage. Rega is surprised that the girl went into the fire to get it. She says it's the only thing he has left of his late mother. They are interrupted by Thelma, and she says they will discuss this later. But right now, they need to treat Regina's wounds. 
If the ointment isn't applied right away, it could leave scars. Riga agrees and takes Regina in his arms. He carries her to their room and asks Thelma to call a doctor. After bandaging Regina's hands, the doctor advises her not to use her hands for a while. She needs to rest properly. When the doctor leaves the chambers, there is a ringing silence in the room. Thelma interrupts and says it was her fault. Benny only followed her orders, so if anyone should be punished, it should be her. Benny says she was the one who sent the clothes to be burned. Rosetta says it's her fault though, because she didn't remove the tape right away. Riga stops them and says that it's nobody's fault and the girls should calm down. The girl's stomach starts rumbling, and Riga tells Thelma that he hasn't eaten yet. The servants left to prepare dinner, leaving them alone. Regina thanked Riga for playing along. The guy abruptly kneels in front of the girl, sliding a bowl of warm water over to her and beginning to wash the girl's feet. Regina asks what he's doing and Riga says he's doing it to thank the girl for saving his mother's thing. He tells her again that he doesn't value the item as much as she thinks he does. The girl recalls that he got so angry in the kitchen that he even pulled out a sword. But Rashid convinces her that it's not about the ribbon, it's about her. Until she showed it to him, he didn't realize what had happened. He thought she had been hurt. They fell silent and it became so quiet, just his touch. Rosetta felt as if she'd forgotten how to breathe. The servants brought them dinner and Rashid asked to keep it. Regina notices that this is the first time they will be eating together. They're having shrimp for dinner, but they don't revere seafood in the Fox Kingdom, so she hasn't tasted it. Regina helps the girl eat, and she is delighted by the taste of the shrimp. She thought it would taste like a bug. How absurd. She never thought it would be, not once to have tasted seafood. Over the conversation, Riga calls Rosetta a child again, and the girl can't stand it and asks how old the man is. He is 23 years old. This leaves the girl in shock. She says they only have an age difference of three years, and he keeps saying that and acting like he's all of 10 years older than her. She tells him not to call her that anymore. Regina tells Riga that Thelma told her that he traveled to the Fox Kingdom disguised as a merchant, and the girl asks why. He says he wants to secure the trade routes, need roads where traders could travel freely, without fear of monsters. It would be much better if monsters didn't appear at all. The girl is surprised because if they have appeared, it means that once there were no monsters. Riga tells her that they do appear. In the ancient records, there is not a word about monsters. They appeared after a time, not all at once. She says she's read a lot, but this is the first time she's heard of it. Riga says she doesn't know Arden, what he told from books written in ancient Latin. They contain information about how life was lived at the time. But at some point, records of monsters began to appear. Around the time of the founding of the Fox Kingdom. Maybe Rosetta was being too arrogant. Perhaps she was deluded, and her world was not at all what she thought it was. Of course, everything she knew couldn't be true. But the amazing thing is, that she only realized it once she stepped outside the palace. The girl asks Rigu how he feels about Terra, especially since he traveled there alone. He replies that it feels like watching a sunset. The moon grows up and out of the sky, people grow old and sick. It's like the fox is going the same way. And what started it all is the tyranny of King Laquileo. Little by little, Rosetta begins to learn about her grandfather. She knows almost nothing about him, any mention of King Laquileo is taboo in Lisa. Every time she thinks of him, goosebumps run down her spine. Riga notices that something is wrong with Regina. The girl tells him she's fine, but he checks her temperature and picks her up to carry her to her room and give her the necessary medication. He leaves her to rest and he himself is about to leave for the next room, but the girl stops him. She asks him to stay. Riga tried to find reasons to dissuade the girl, but found none and agrees to stay. Lying in bed, the girl interrupts the silence with her thoughts. She is sure that he will make a great husband and father. He is so kind to her, especially with someone he will truly love. She realized it right away. Riga rises from the bed to look at the girl. If she took after her father, she would be a cruel and brutal man, and he would treat her accordingly. But she had not hesitated to put her hands in the fire for the sake of those she had known for a few days. Interceded, knowing the possibility of punishment, She'd better be careful with people. In the dream, the girl started saying the name Masha. She was asking for something not to do. This made Rig worried, 
and he tried to wake the girl up from her nightmare. In trying to wake her up, the guy only succeeded in getting her to snuggle closer to him. Rashid feels like he made a big mistake in taking her with him. Rosetta woke up before Rashid. When he woke up a little later, he checked on his Regina's condition and warned her that he had to leave. He said she could ask Thelma or Benny to give her a tour of the neighborhood. When Rega left the room, the servants asked him what he would like for breakfast. But he said that he had to go now, and they should bring breakfast to Regina. Rashid also asked Thelma to invite the merchants to the castle. The ones that sell fabrics, jewelry, and all sorts of trinkets that women love. He says it's for Regina. When her hands are healed, they should have a ball in her honor. Before then, they need to get everything ready. The servants come to Regina's house with warm water for washing and decide to help her so they don't wet the bandages. In the process, Thelma apologizes for yesterday. She should have taken care of that tape. The maid recalls a time when Rashid's mother braided her hair with that ribbon. They were very close, like sister. Thelma thanked Regina once again for keeping the item that belonged to Mrs. Alicia. Regina has one request for Benny. She asks her to teach her the Arden language. Benny says that this is not necessary at all, since all the high-ranking gentlemen speak Latin. But Rosetta says the locals don't know it. If she knew a little Ardenese, what happened could have been prevented. In that case, Benny is more than happy to teach Regina Ardenese. There are people sitting around a long table chatting about the latest news. They're talking about Riga making a Basque girl his Regina. And not just any girl, but the daughter of the chief. One of them asks what would happen if they were of the same blood. But the other man interrupts him and tells him to be careful what he says. He says he has heard that the son of one of the elders almost lost his leg for saying such things. Apparently, the poor guy's gonna have a limp for the rest of his life. I guess that'll teach everyone a lesson. There is a knock at the door, and Mr. Calante enters the room with the men. Elder Calante. One of the men asks the elder if he has met Riga, and how he explained what happened. Elder Calante says he didn't tell him much, but he urges the men to look into it all again. Their Riga found the perfect way out of the situation. After all, he sacrificed himself for the well-being of the tribe. The elder assures them, if anyone didn't want this wedding more than anyone else, it was Riga. There is a thoughtful silence in the hall. A Persian elder walks in. Elder Kalante approaches him and tells him that they have been waiting for him. Kalante also asks Purse about his son's condition. He replies that he is better and thanks him for his concern. Elder Kalante says that Riga is also very worried. He is very annoyed about agreeing to this duel. Even though Krella summoned him himself, he feels that he should have been more tolerant. The elder also says that if he needs anything, he will be happy to help. Elder Percy himself remembers reprimanding Krell for this transgression. He told him to take his time. He was to keep his head down and not attract attention. That's all. They'd waited so long, and he'd just gone and ruined everything in an instant. Twenty years ago, their Riga had been murdered in Basque land. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Being a bastard child, he couldn't qualify for the role. All he could do was watch helplessly, silently watching his half-brother take that place. To save the woman he loved, he went to the Basques, and there he met his death. The elders began to discuss who would be the next Riga. The true heir had not yet been born, so Elder Calante suggested they wait. Regina gave birth to a boy with cursed blue eyes. Then he learned the shocking truth that when Regina was brought to the Basques, she was thrown to the slaves. Of course, the elders had turned their backs on her and her cursed child. Everything was going perfectly until Regina killed herself. That proved her innocence and cut off his plan at the root. From now on, Krell couldn't become Rega, even if Rashid disappeared. And it was all because of his timing. But they say life always gives you three chances. He has one last one left, and he will wait. Rega returns to the castle, pondering the fact that suspicious descendants of Lisa have not yet been caught. Walking into the stables, he is greeted by the stable boy, Mark. Riga notices that he doesn't even look bad, and is surprised that he hasn't been drinking today. The stable boy chuckles and asks about Regina's condition. Riga relays the doctor's words that everything will heal soon, and the scars, if any, will be almost invisible. Mark is happy for Regina's speedy recovery. Rashid is alarmed, for he thought he didn't like her. The stable boy says that at first he did, 
because she's the Basque daughter. But when he learned that she had rushed to rescue his mother's belongings despite the danger, he changed his mind. Riga is visited by thoughts that the girl has an amazing ability to influence people. Thelma, Benny, even Mark, and it is not easy to earn their respect. He doesn't know her at all. Riga returns to his chambers, but there is a haunting silence. He calls out to Rosie, but she doesn't answer. He hears some rustling, suspects a mercenary, and reaches for his sword. He lunges at what is probably the mercenary, sword in hand, when he is stopped by Regina's voice asking him to stop. He asks her what she's doing, but the girl says she was only trying to pick up a hairbrush when he walked in. Rega says her hands aren't working well yet. Then why was she combing her own hair? The girl says her hair was dry and Benny looked so tired and she told her to go to bed. The doctor on the other hand said it was fine and she could hold something in her hands. The guy says he almost killed her just now. She was behind the curtain and he mistook her for a hired assassin. He asks next time to stay where he can see her right away. The girl continued to comb her hair, but the comb fell out of her hands again. Rashid asks if she has never done it herself. He gets up and picks up the comb from the floor and pulls a chair over to the girl, asking her to sit down. He begins to brush her hair himself and says that at this rate there will be nothing left of the room. Rashid tells Rosetta that he told Thelma to invite the merchants. She will have a large selection. She'll be able to get anything she likes. Rashid thinks about the fact that large and bright jewelry is not good for her. She would prefer pearls, delicate and quiet. Something unpretentious, but graceful and elegant. Riga lolls on the bed, and Rosetta takes a seat on the other side. She surmises that if he's often been accosted by mercenaries at night, has he not been able to sleep well all this time? The boy says he's used to shallow sleep by now. Regina says that then, while she's here, he can get a good night's sleep. She offers to take turns being on duty, but Rega interrupts her and asks who will protect who if someone climbs in while he's sleeping. Rosetta says that some might find it romantic, and others might find it frightening and disgusting. Rashid doesn't understand what the girl is talking about. She explains that she is referring to the night visit. Rega still doesn't understand her. Regina tells him that it is an ancient custom of the Fox Kingdom. It was usually held in private homes. The man would sneak into the woman's room before the wedding. The higher up the floor she lived, the harder it was to climb. The more sincere his love was professed. But because of a number of cases where men fell out of windows and crashed to their deaths, this custom was banned, although it probably wasn't really observed. Riga says that of course there are idiots everywhere who will do anything for love, it's no surprise. Rosetta says that if someone were to climb up to her like that, in spite of the danger, just to see her, she would probably be moved to tears. Riga says that it's much more likely that a thief would come across her like that. The girl comments that he's ruining the whole atmosphere again. She suggests he just listen. The locals meet Duke Isil and whisper that he's supposed to marry the youngest princess from the Fox Kingdom soon. They say the wandering poet Asian himself dedicated his songs to her. A maiden runs out in front of Isil's horse, and the guards grab her, asking if she knows who is in front of her, and tie her hands. Isil stops the guards and orders them to let her go. She seems to be in need of money, so Isil orders that they give her the necessary amount and let her go. But the girl blurts out that she doesn't need the money at all. She only wants him to look into the unjust death of her brother. The locals began to chastise the girl, saying that the Duke doesn't have time for this. But she continued, saying that her brother's name was Hugh. He was going to deliver something to the Duke, but was killed the next day. The Duke was interested in this, and he began to question the girl. She said that the investigator on his case said he just killed himself, but the girl is sure he couldn't have done it. So the Duke decides to take the girl with him. He brought the girl to the castle and himself offered to continue the conversation. The girl tells him that he was found a week ago, hanging from a tree growing on a hill. Under his feet was a farewell letter. The Duke clarifies that the girl does not believe in the version of suicide. She says that the idea alone is absurd. He was going to get married. He was happy. Isil further tries to find a motive. Maybe he had debts he could not pay, or he made a fatal mistake. But the girl interrupts him saying that her brother is not like that. He wouldn't have left her alone. Isel is still trying to explain that he's not going to judge the girl's brother, 
just that stuff could have happened. Duke is trying to figure out what her brother was going to meet him for. The girl tells him that a man from the Basque tribe came and asked him to give you a message. This letter was taken from him by the Archduke. He said he would give it to Duke Isil. Isil says he finds this strange, for his father is not the kind of man who would open his mail or hide it from him. The girl also says that her brother said that with this letter came an emerald bracelet. When the Archduke saw it, he was very surprised and said he would give it to her himself. And after that, her younger brother was found dead with a forged letter. It was Hugh's handwriting, but it wasn't his. Her brother could barely read, let alone write a letter. But the letter was smooth and beautiful. The Duke put his hand on the girl's shoulder in an approving gesture and promised to attend to the matter and advised her to go back to her room and try to rest, for she had been through so much. When the girl left the Duke's office, Isil began to ponder the information he had received. A week ago, when the Archduke received that letter, he had just left the castle. But his father hadn't said anything to him about it, and it concerned the Basque tribe, with whom he had not yet had any contact. At his request, a butler named Aston comes to his office. The Duke lets him in and asks him to sit down. The butler realizes that the Duke is having a rather serious conversation with him, since his request cannot be discussed standing up. Isolt says he needs to find one bracelet. The butler doesn't understand what the bracelet is, but the Duke knows that the man has already figured out what the conversation is about. Isil talks about the bracelet he gave to the Princess of the Fox Kingdom, Rosetta. He tells the butler to search all the stores selling jewelry and ornaments, and to remember to look at the black market and pawn stores, underground ones included. The Duke adds that this also applies to his father's safes. 